Hello. 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 Hello, hello. There is Nelly. Hi, Nelly. Hi, Nelly. Adi says hi, Nelly. So notice on the screen the snow is a little bit lighter today. We're having a bright sunny day here. It's very cold out there. Though. Though, although. But it's bright and sunny. It's pretty nice for a Christmas day. Good day for some gardening. Good day for some gardening. A little bit of gardening going on out there. We made the we we I didn't do anything today. <laughs> I was doing You looked at it, you said very good. I looked at it and it said very good. It's very pretty. We went and bought some new you made a painting. sort of decoration <laughs> plants sort of stuff. You're made the sponsor. A You're the philanthropist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm the troublemaker, huh? Anyway, so here we are again with our friend Swami Rama. And on Christmas, this is not anti-God, but the title of his writing on this is Enlightenment Without God. The principle being that in the, the most important part of our enlightenment stuff is what we do with ourself in our own levels of consciousness. As has been said other places, other times, it's a 50-50 deal, this spiritual life or yoga life, whatever you want to call it. It's a 50-50 deal. We have to do our 50% and guru, grace, God, whatever you want to call that force, does the other part. We have to go halfway <coughs> and that grace pulls us the rest of the way. In honor of the day, we can quote, the teacher of that text who said, knock and the door will be open. Who's going to do the knocking for us? Nobody. Nobody's going to knock on the door for us. We have to do our own knocking. We have to get our own sort of bloody knuckles, so to speak. And that's our 50%. So that's the spirit of what this knock, is about knock, here. Now Raj is over there singing to us. Anyway, this is about Mandukya Upanishad, which is 12 very succinct, 12 verses. And as is normal in yoga tradition, it's sutra style, very short verses. And then the, the joy, the understanding, the insight, and the benefits come from talking about what they are. So it's oral tradition predominantly, not written tradition. And so we have some written stuff here from Swami Rama, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Hi, Rosalind. Namaste. Hi, Nelly again. Hi, Mir. And so here we are. I think we have some hot chocolate in the brew here. Pretty good deal, huh? Uh-huh. It's coming soon, maybe. Do we still have a little bit of light snow on the screen? Can you see it falling down there? There it is. Anyway, it's only 12 verses, and we are now on verse 10 of the 12. But to get us sort of oriented on where we are, they're short verses, so I'll go back again and just simply, excuse me, read through the first nine here and i think you're gonna like that reminder if you've been following along with it you'll like the reminder because once you know what some of these are then excuse me then when you read through it christmas morning huh then when you read through it it's a, oh and we got our hot chocolate in starbucks cups that's pretty nice thank you we just got it from starbucks office. Starbucks to go. This tastes to me more like a Ma box. Ma box, probably. Ma tree box. Bless you. Now you don't have to exaggerate. It wasn't that cold outside. 
<laughs> anyway, so we're going to review the first nine, then go to number 10 and see what Swami Rama has to say and if any other conversation comes up here. Number one, Hari Om. Hari Om. Om. The entire universe is the syllable Om. The following is the exposition of Om. Everything in the past, present, and future is verily Om. That which is beyond time, space, and causation is also Om. And what isn't Om? Nothing is excluded. <laughs> it's pretty big, isn't it? Two, all this whatsoever is seen here, there, and everywhere is Brahma. Brahma not being the name of God, but just a word connoting that in, in infinite non-dual reality. This very self, Atman, the individual consciousness, is Brahman, the infinite consciousness, the absolute reality. This Atman has four aspects. Count them, one, two, three, four. And next is number three. Now it's going to go through those four aspects. The first aspect is the waking state, Vaishranar. In this state, consciousness is turned to the external. With its seven instruments and 19 channels, it experiences the gross phenomenal world, what we know out here. Number four, the second aspect is the dreaming state, Tejasa. In this state, consciousness is turned inward. It also has seven instruments and 19 channels which experience the subtle mental impressions. All righty. Number five. The third aspect is deep sleep, prajna. In this state, there is neither desire nor dream. In deep sleep, all experiences merge Yeah. In, deep, in deep sleep, all experiences, wow, instantaneous. <laughs> all experiences, I'm going to say this yet, in deep sleep, all experiences merge into the unity of undifferentiated consciousness. The sleeper is filled with bliss and experiences bliss and can find the way to knowledge of the two preceding states. Six, the experiencer of these states of consciousness is the Lord of all. This one is all-knowing. This one directs everything from within. This one is the womb of all. All things originate from and dissolve into this. Seven, Turiya is the fourth state. In this state, consciousness is not turned inward, nor outward, nor both. It is undifferentiated. It is beyond the spheres of cognition and non-cognition. This state cannot be experienced through the senses or known by comparison or inference. It is incomprehensible, unthinkable, and indescribable. This is pure consciousness. This is the real self. It is the cessation of all phenomena. It is tranquil, all blissful, and one without a second. This real self is to be realized. Pretty cool, huh? Adi says, hmm. Dad, this is a good Christmas story. It's a good Christmas story, isn't it? Oops, wait a minute. Lost my place. There. Pure consciousness, which has number eight. Pure consciousness, which has been described as having four states, is indivisible. It is Om. 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 
the sounds a u m and the letters a u m are the three states of waking, dreaming, and sleeping. And these three states are the three sounds and letters. But the fourth, but the fourth state, which is unknown and hidden, is realized only in silence. Only. Oh. The silence after. The silence after the own. Number nine, the consciousness experience during the waking state is A, the first letter of OM, the A. Ah. It pervades all other sounds. Without the syllable A, one cannot utter the word OM. You have to have an A ah to have an U and an M. Mm. You, you can't even, see, I can't even do it. It's not possible. To, to do the middle part, the ooh. See, as soon as I say ooh, ooh. it starts in the beginning with the ah. The ah is there. It's just, it just cannot be done without the ah. Without the first syllable ah, one cannot utter the word om. And likewise, without knowing the waking state, one cannot know the other states of consciousness. Here we are. One who is aware of this reality fulfills all his desires and is successful. Now we come to verse 10. Get ready. It's building up. Crescendo drum roll. Okay, here's number 10. The consciousness experienced during the dreaming state is you or U, the second letter of Om. This is an elevated intermediate state between the waking and sleeping states. One who knows this subtler state is superior to others, not that it's a competition. One who knows this in his family, knowers of Brahman will be born. Sort of like saying that if we know truth, then the other people around us will gradually pick it up too. Pretty cool, huh? Now, let's see. What does Swami Rama have to add to this? He has a few pages of something to add. It's pretty good stuff, isn't it? The second phoneme, U or U, is of the same nature as the dreaming reality, Tejasa. When the aspirant becomes capable of analyzing and realizing the nature of U and the dreaming reality through deep contemplation and meditation, he attains knowledge of and mastery over his unconscious mind. Hmm. Note that the suggestion is when one becomes capable of analyzing and realizing the nature of the U. It does not use as a starting point that who I am is this person out in the waking state, and I, as this waking state me, am going to analyze my dreams, as if going to the dream therapist to say, "Let's, what does that dream mean to me? That's not what is the point is here. The point is here that we are that pure consciousness that is beyond all of these three levels. So here we're wanting to analyze and realize the nature of the U and dreaming reality through deep contemplation and meditation so that we can attain knowledge of and mastery over our unconscious mind. And if we can do that, then we can move beyond it in direct experience. Swami Rama goes on, after analyzing the nature of the mind and its modifications, what's going on in the mind, after doing that, the aspirant becomes aware of the subtle impressions or samskars that create all the objects of the dreams. Dreams are not just floating around. They're not just flooding around like a little windstorm blowing leaves around. It's not that. It arises from somewhere. And that's what we're trying to find. Listen to this again. After analyzing the nature of the mind 
and analyzing its modifications, comma, then the aspirant becomes aware of the subtle impressions or the samskaras, those deep impressions, comma, that create all the objects of the dreams. After doing this, we come to understand something about those deep impressions that are the source out of which the dreams occur. Very deep. We're getting deeper and deeper and deeper, aren't we? Listen to this. The aspirant then overcomes, overcomes negative mental attitudes such as animosity, jealousy, and hatred. Note here again, one more time we see that the yogis deal with bad habits at the deepest, deepest of their root levels, not on the surface level out here. Out here, what we do out here in relationships in the world is important. But what's really more important is the deepest level of those impressions. And that's what it's saying. Then we are really free. Then we are really free. The aspirant then overcome, overcomes negative mental attitudes such as animosity, jealousy, and, and negative mental attitudes and hatred. Being the middle phoneme, the U, the U, the intermediate state, is more subtle than the, is superior to the A, the first. We all like laying in bed having a nice dream. But the plane of reality is not that the dream itself is better, but the plane of reality in which the dream occurs is higher or subtler or deeper, choose your metaphor, than is what we're doing in the waking state. We have fallen asleep into our identities in the world out here. And we're trying to awaken to that, which is this Turiya, that fourth state. Being the middle phoneme, the U, the immediate intermediate state is more subtle and superior to the A, the first. It deals with the world as being comprised of ideas rather than objects, and is thus closer to the capital T truth. Still not there, but it's closer. This world of ours is an idea, point being that everything out here emerged from what is going on in that subtler domain. Without an idea, creativity is lost in bewilderment. And I think in a sense, we all already know that. Everything creatively that we do out here, they just worked today on setting up this garden out here. Well, that would not have happened if not for the ideas about having that garden. So the ideas lead to the manifestation of the garden. Hi, Johnny. The entire, listen to this, the entire, wait a minute. Bewilderment. Huh? Bewilderment. Bewilderment. It is the idea that. I got lost here. Where It deals with the world without an idea. Oh, it is the, I, without an idea, creativity is lost in bewilderment. It is the idea that builds the worldly structure for human beings. Therefore, idea is the architect and is superior to the construction. Such an aspirant who realizes the state of the U can inspire others, for he unfolds the mystery of ideas and creativity both. So there's a sequence to that. The waking reality is always considered to be a creative and dynamic state, for one has the opportunity and instrumentation to express oneself in the external world. We can only do that out here in the, in the waking state. The entire educational system is devoted to the cultivation of this state, of this waking state. For life is divided into two aspects, within and without. 
it is important to manage the external aspect of life. Before I read these three reasons, I'll make a comment here. It's very easy in so-called spiritual life of meditation and contemplation to want to run away from this world out here. I have figured out that the, the spiritual is what I'm looking for, and all of this out here is a waste of time. It's very tempting to go in that direction. But again, it is important to manage the external aspect of life for three reasons. Then he letters them. A, it might become the means for gaining higher knowledge and satisfying the sense gratifications, this external aspect. B, it gives knowledge of the phenomenal world and its transitory nature, comma, which inspires the mind of the aspirant to search through other dimensions of life and the waking state is a conscious state. So it inspires us to go deeper. So it's a good thing to do stuff out here. And if the aspirant learns to use this, there's a C, but they didn't put it down in the book. And C, the waking state is, and, and if the aspirant learns to use this state for contemplation and meditation, it gives him the power of expanding his field of experience compared to those who do not meditate and contemplate. So in both the meditation and contemplation, we're starting out here in the waking state using the conscious mind. So it's not a bad thing. We use it for that purpose. The experiencer experiences waking, dreaming, and sleeping realities and during these experiences, finds himself absorbed in that particular state and unaware of the other states. So when we're sitting out here like we are right now, in the waking state, most of us, most of the time, are not aware of that unconscious processing. It's going on. The same level of reality that does dreaming is going on right now to help us be able to process information so we can have a conversation. It's going on, but it's out of view. And we have little awareness of the deep level, the hard drive level that has all of the data stored so that we can have a conversation. Most of us are only aware of the surface. And when we're laying in bed dreaming, we have left behind the world out here. Now, our dream may replicate this world out here because we're dreaming about people and places we're familiar with, but within the dream itself, it's its own world, and we have left behind the world out here. And we all like to do that. It's nice to lay down and take a little nap and have a, have a nice dream, nice little fantasy. Maybe we can sing a song or something like that. finds himself absorbed in that particular state and unaware of the other states. When he analyzes his role in different states as sleeper, dreamer, and cognizer of the external world, when we do that, then he wonders and wants to comprehend the entire field of consciousness and witnesses it collectively by attaining a state beyond. And it's only by attempting to explore those three levels that this curiosity emerges. Then we, then only through that process, then we say, wow, there's something to this. I really do want to experience these operating together. And I really do want to experience this fourth state beyond. There's something to this. And that is our own direct experience. It's our own insight. It's not just what some book says. We, if we explore waking, if we explore dreaming, and we explore deep sleep as best we can, then the curiosity just rises and rises and rises. It says, I want to know it all. I want to know it all. From where comes the curiosity? It comes. No, from where? From what? Go find it. That's the game. From the untangable. That's the game that we're playing. 
Don't turn to me and ask me to tell you where where it is. I'm asking the question myself. Good, thank you. That's why I'm giving it back to you. It, it's a mirror. It just comes bouncing right back. Or it's a boomerang, if you prefer that metaphor. It just comes bouncing back. You're stuck with that. No escaping it. Huh? It's a good question to pose to yourself. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's called prayer. That's called prayer. Petition. Somebody, if somebody out there, please answer me. I'm trying to solve this riddle. That's actually a good thing to do because then maybe that will open the door to to that grace that comes and when you knock on the door the door opens and the answer comes. And I'm going to take a sip of my hot chocolate here. Cheers. 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 Happy, Christmas. Happy Christmas. It's 1030. And co collectively by attaining wants to Un comprehend the entire field of consciousness and witnesses it collectively by attaining a state beyond. After examining the waking state, he likes to examine consciousness during the dreaming state. So let us examine the waking state. Then we get curious and we say, ah, I want to examine the dreaming state. During dreams, one is not aware of the phenomenal world the way he is aware during the waking state because his body and senses are at rest. And his conscious mind is also moving toward the sleeping state. So all of the apparatus of the waking state conscious mind is starting to move in the direction of itself, receding back, switching off, so to speak, in the deep sleep state. It's like a dimmer switch on a light bulb. You, you do the dimmer switch and the lights just go down. And there goes the mind. And we all kind of know this, don't we? Because we observe it happen when we go to bed at night, we fall asleep. We can observe that something's happening. Something's disappearing. Something is receding inward. Whoa. In this state, only the past memories from the unconscious are realized. That sounds like a very simple sentence, but I want to break it apart a little bit. In this state, of dreaming. Only the past memories from the unconscious are recalled. There's a subtlety there. In this dreaming state, those past memories which have just come forward from the unconscious, from the unconscious, that's what the dream is. Listen to it carefully. In this state of dreaming, only the past memories from the unconscious are recalled. It's not just that they are there floating around in the dream. They came from somewhere. They came from somewhere. And when we can start to have little, even momentary glimpses from inside of the dream state, that you're, you're having a dream about two people, and all of a sudden a third character pops into the dream. Where did that character come from? It came from somewhere. A moment ago, the dream was only you and two people. Now there's a third person walked onto the stage of the dream, like, like in the theater. A third, a third actor walks out on the stage. Where did he come from? From behind the curtain. And this, we want to go behind the curtain, and that's what here is being referred to as the unconscious. And that's the M level, which comes in the, in the next verse. Actually, in this state, in actually, no one can determine dreaming ordinarily. He's making this point ordinarily. Probably should have inserted the word ordinarily. If someone determines to dream about something, it is not possible for him to dream the way that he wants. Point being that our dreams are pretty much normally operated by the habit patterns in that unconscious that is beyond. So they come forward and they lead to dream. If we become yogis, then we can do something to alter those dreams because we are learning eventually how to alter what's, what's in the unconscious. 
the determination that is built during the waking state is not applied to the reality of the dreaming state. One can give suggestions to oneself and then can recall those suggestions and think that he has trained himself and dream and dream the way he wants. But actually the dream state is beyond the control of the ordinary person's conscious mind. So if we want to do something, we have to become not ordinary. When the experiencer is not in touch with the objects of the world, his senses do not perceive fresh impressions from them. Kind of obvious, isn't it? During that state of mind, the flow of those suppressions and suppressions comes forward. So they're stored in the unconscious. Now, when, when we're not engaged out here, they naturally come forward. Though it is an interruption while one's mind is moving toward the sleeping state, Yet it offers an opportunity for one to analyze his desires, motivations, feelings, and thoughts. So one is headed for the deep sleep, but those images and impressions come forward into the dreaming state, and then there's all this activity in the dreaming state, and it's difficult to go through it to find the deep unconscious. but it does offer an opportunity to, to analyze that which is coming forward. But we try to never lose sight of this is coming forward from someplace deeper. And I want to, I want to go there. I want to know what's going on in that deeper place where these ideas are coming from. At this stage, the mind ponders over unfulfilled desires, feelings, and attachments. The dream world is unique in itself, and in it, the prominent habits of mind can be analyzed. And where are those habit patterns stored in that deeper unconscious part that comes forward into the dream? The dream world is unique in itself, and in it, the prominent habits of mind can be analyzed. Deep-rooted desires cause frequent and repetitive dreams. If there is no desire or want to fulfill, there will be no necessity to dream. The only reason for the dream is something wants to express itself. Dream is the product of those desires that are unfulfilled. The mind travels to the grooves of its unfulfilled desires and creates a predominant habit pattern. Thus, dreams can be worth analyzing to help one understand the prominent habits of one's mind. That's how the word, the dreams are worth analyzing because it reveals to one the habit patterns that are stored in the unconscious. It's not directly seeing them because they're having to come to light. So that third person that comes to the dream, it lets you know that there is a third person down in the unconscious. Otherwise, you wouldn't know that person was there. But again, there are varieties of habits, and sometimes the aspirant thinks that he has complete control over his thoughts, desires, and feelings. But again, he finds that there are dark corners of the unconscious mind where still lie some hidden desires. And those hidden desires come forward into the dream. That's why we want to see them, because it reveals, oh, wow, there was something that was hidden and I didn't know it was there. Suppose one has apparently vacuumed the carpet of his living room and it looks very neat and clean, but he lifts up the corner of the carpet, he will find that a layer of dirt is hidden beneath, and that is the unconscious. So is the case with the unconscious mind. When an aspirant goes through the various levels of unconsciousness, 
A time comes when his whole mind becomes topsy-turvy. This that he's about to talk about here is extremely important to understand because we can think we're making progress in meditation. My mind is getting calm. Life is good. This meditation stuff is really, really wonderful. And then comes a point where we get good enough to start to be prepared to see the unconscious and it starts coming forward. And then you think, I'm going backwards. I can remember the days when I could have a nice, quiet, peaceful, serene meditation. And now all of a sudden I'm going crazy. It's actually a sign of progress. Now, this is me speaking. What is, what is topsy-turvy? Topsy-turvy means, it, it means the way your hand gestures there. It's just turning over and over and over. All this is coming forward. Where the hell is this coming from? Topsy-turvy. But a burning desire for attaining the goal of life can annihilate the other desires. They just don't have an effect because it's like, no, I have some understanding that I'm trying to wake up out of this entire dream world. I want to know the pure consciousness. That's what's driving me. So these things, okay, they're driving me crazy, but they are not going to actually win. I'm going to fight the battle of life. This is the symbol of Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Did not want to fight the battle of, of life. They, it's, a, it's, it's a story about an army on the other side of the field. What it's really about is his own unconscious mind that is doing what's said here. Swami Rama calls topsy-turvy. And he doesn't want to do it. I don't want to look at that. It's part of my makeup. I don't want to look at that. I want to run away out here into the waking state world and just live a quiet life in the forest. Krishna says, no, 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 you have to go through this unconscious. It's no big deal. Just go through it. And here's how. But a burning desire for attaining the goal of life can annihilate the other desires, feelings, and thoughts. In such a case, one goes beyond this turmoil and experiences the higher dimensions for which he was longing but you have to go through the storm, inescapable. The mind also has the quality of pacifying itself no matter how difficult a problem may be. It's going to make it okay. That which cannot be dealt with by the mind during the waking state is dealt with during the dreaming state. That is why it is called a more subtle state than the waking state. This state is therapeutic because in it one has the opportunity to express oneself the way one wants to. All the unfulfilled desires, thoughts, and feelings, which for any reason are not fulfilled during the waking state, create a dreaming reality. All of those unconscious, unfulfilled desires, they come to life in the dreaming. One cannot dream of something he has never seen, imagined, heard of, or read about. Now I can combine and recombine the old things and create a new storyline. It appears to be a new thing, but it's just a, 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 re, a new composite of the same old stuff. The individual self experiences many dimensions of reality, and the dreaming reality is one of them. During dreaming, the mind wants to bring forward and express those ideas, desires, thoughts, and feelings, which for some reason could not be expressed during the waking state. One cannot understand the dreaming state merely by analyzing a few dreams. That's, that's not the way to do it. So, in mind, you may have a dream, you know, to rob the bank down the street, but you're not going to do it out, uh, out here. You can rob the bank over and over in the dream world. You don't go to jail for that unless your dream puts you in jail. During the dreaming state, one completely forgets what he was in the waking state. One is rewarded in the dreaming state and whipped in the dreaming state. So both rewards and punishments are given at a more subtle and mental level during the dreaming state. It is a finer state than is the waking state. Another little sip of this really fine hot chocolate. 
Hmm. Ah. Desire coming from the latent unconscious, and there it is. One can magnify all of one's desires and fears in dreams because dreaming is a self-created state. Many people dream in the daytime. Therefore, the waking reality is compared by the sages to the dreaming reality. So sages say, this that we think out here is the waking state. No, it's actually, it's a dream world that we have created. Doesn't mean it's not here but it's a dream world. For the wise, both states are alike because they give only a partial glimpse of the totality. That which one acquires in the conscious waking state vanishes in the dreaming state, and that which is acquired in the dreaming state vanishes in the waking state. You rob the bank in the dream, but you wake up and you realize you're just as broke as ever. No money. What to do? Desire does not really vanish in the dreaming state, but it seems to vanish when one goes to deep sleep. Actually, desire does not vanish even in deep sleep. One is simply not aware of one's desires in this state. Yogi gradually wants to become aware of it. Desire really vanishes only when one attains the fourth state to real, which is beyond them all. Then, then it is resolved. It is understood. It is analyzed because there all, there all one's desires are fulfilled by vanishing. They're just not there. In waking, one obtains objects of the phenomenal world and achieves external success. But in Turiya, one experiences completeness. One no longer desires anything lower once he has attained something higher. All the great laws of physics have been discovered in the contemplative state and the unique works of art and literature are the products of the contemplative mind. History has recorded scientists and musicians and artists who have made this observation, that this stuff that they're doing, that they give credit, Nobel Prizes for being so smart, that it came from some place inside that they don't understand. Where did this come from? All of a sudden, I had this big idea. I read a story about a mathematician who came up with a solution to a big mathematical formula. And 30 years later, he was saying, the thing that's most astounding to me is I don't know where the answer came from. And it took him 30 years to make the mathematical proof that it was a correct formula. And somehow, it just one day, it struck him. Others, a musician, will just sort of internally feel or hear the music. And it comes forward. And they'll speak of the amazement of where this is coming from. And they don't have an answer to it. There's an Indian mathematician who was very famous 100 years ago. He said most of the theories that he came up with, it, everything came in his dream. Yeah. Fascinating. Meditation and contemplation both require a one-pointed mind. But the difference is that during meditation and contemplation, one consciously places himself in a concentrated and undisturbed state. During the dreaming state, there is no control, and one is not conscious the way one is conscious and in control in the waking state. So when we complain and say, Oh, I, I came born into this stupid, crazy world. Maybe I shouldn't have been born at all. But in the dreaming world, that, that world between births out here, things are zipping around so fast you can have no control. Think about it in the dream. The dream seems to be running you. But when you come out here, everything slows down. And when it slows down, it's more manageable. 
So being out here is not a bad thing. Out here in the waking state, we can actually do contemplation and not get dragged around by all the craziness of that otherwise unconscious dream state. Something to it. Control here, control here measures the ability of focusing the mind towards its desired goal. There are varieties of dreams, but here it is the entire dream state and the reality that is experienced during it that are being discussed. In other words, we're not just saying, I had a dream about that thing and what does that mean to me? The detail of every dream is irrelevant to the yogi. What is wanted to be known is this entire state. How is this process working? I have these seeds down in the deep unconscious. They keep coming up, swirling around and creating Hollywood movies and dramas. And then they come out here into the gross world and it does it again. How is this process working? So that, and I want to know that so I can get beyond it. During meditation, one remains fully awake and conscious. But during dreaming, one is not conscious and the unconscious impressions appear whether one desires them to do so or not. In the dreaming state, they just come forward from the latent unconscious. In the dreaming state, one has no control. But in meditation, one has perfect control. When it is said that one can remain fully conscious while dreaming, it means that one can remain in meditation and recall all the unfulfilled desires that are expressed during that time. One can then analyze and resolve them. And that analysis is by, so, by awareness of it and having it unravel as to how it turned into this fantasy in the first place. In comparing meditation with the dreaming state, one notes that the mind is made inward in meditation and is not allowed to slip to the valley of inertia or imagine about the future. It's one-pointed and it allows everything to come, but it is not going to get sucked into any of it. The mind is trained to maintain a single focal point of meditation voluntarily. This gives the, the aspirant an opportunity to judge, analyze, and decide the usefulness of the impressions coming from the unconscious that create the dreaming reality. Notice there's several phrases in there that go together. I'm going to say this again slowly. Just let it sink in. It's not just one thought. There's several things sort of stuck together. The mind is trained to maintain the single focal point of meditation voluntarily. Maybe it's the breath, for example. This gives the aspirant an opportunity to judge, analyze, and decide the usefulness of the impressions coming from the unconscious. Which impressions? Those which create dreaming reality. So it's not just that I'm analyzing the dream. I'm seeing those objects that come forward. When we elsewhere have talked about the seven levels of consciousness, this is the transition level called Aladini, where the, where that third person enters into the dream, comes through the, the boundary line, comes from behind the curtain into the dream. Where was he before he entered the dream? He was behind the curtain. So there's behind the curtain, that's the latent unconscious. Then there's the transition of the curtain itself where he comes just behind the, out from the curtain and now is in your dream. So here the yogi is wanting to observe those transitions where the objects are coming from the latent unconscious into the dream state. This is an intermediate state, the dreaming, an intermediate state between sleeping and waking in which the ordinary mind remains in a semi-conscious state. One is neither in deep sleep, nor is he awake. Gradually, though, I'll add, gradually what we're trying to do is be aware of the process by which those characters are coming from behind the curtain into the dream. 
And then that dream comes out through another curtain and comes out into the waking state world. And the next thing you know, I'm running around in the kitchen looking for my doses. I want doses for lunch. And so there's this whole process that's going on there. Yogi wants to know that. During meditation, the meditator can experience all that which is experienced during the dreaming state. He is fully conscious, although he is not utilizing his senses and not contacting the external objects. When the conscious state is expanded, dream analysis becomes clear. Expanded means I'm sitting here in the conscious waking state mind and I expand like this. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in the, I'm awake. I'm in the waking state of conscious using the conscious mind. And I open those doors so that I can see the dreams. Not that that dream has meaning to me, but then I can see that that dream came from those characters that came from behind that curtain back there. Those characters come from behind the curtain into the dream. And then normally they come from that dream out here to the waking state. And then I'm getting dragged around out here by my wants and wishes and desires in the world. And what we want to do is be able to, from the waking state, observe that entire process. When the conscious state is expanded, dream analysis becomes clear and the ideas and symbols that are experienced during that state are easily understood, meaning how it is that they are seeds from the deep unconscious. From a sadhana viewpoint, dreams are divided into two categories, those which are helpful to one's sadhana and those which are harmful to one's sadhana. Impressions or ideas from the waking state that appear during the dreaming state can be helpful and can be injurious both. If one has clear introspection of this process, the harmful and injurious dreams that strain and distract the mind and its energy can be analyzed and resolved. All conflicts that are at the root of dreams can be resolved. Strong comment, all of them. This is a great sentence coming up here. It's one of the most important ones in this whole thing. It's one of the places where we're starting to make some advancement, and if we're not aware of this principle, we really think we're going backwards. Oh. Swamiji, Swamiji, one question before the uh, before this sentence. Uh, Read the sentence. No, no, no. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Either that or I'm going to go on without. Well, speak. Oh, okay. Uh, a, the, about the, with those which are helpful to one sadhana and those that are harmful to uh, one sadhana. Uh, in waking state, or in, uh, it reminds me of Yoga Sutra, uh, where what do we do with negative? Nothing. Nothing. Mm, so, and here. So, what is your question? Get to the point, please. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but I, I don't want to spend 20 minutes dragging through the question that, and never hearing a question. You know, yeah, it's not said that we do, don't do nothing with, uh, where are we? Uh, you want everything to be written in the book? No. Okay, I'll contemplate. Go on. Thank you. A time comes when meditation stirs the unconscious mind and brings forward impressions from its hidden recesses. It quickens the method of analyzing, understanding, and surveying the whole dreaming state. The whole process can be speeded up. Very rare is a person who will ever stick with meditation long enough to experience this, is what I've observed. Very, very few people will come this far. We just say meditation is me having a quiet, stress-free, calm mind in the waking state. How do I get rid of these thoughts? There's a point along the way where it speeds up, where your mind is going many times faster than you ever realize that it is operating 
at all times. It is a sign of progress. Vast majority of us will not see that, will not look at this saying here and will overlook it and say, once again, how do I get my mind to shut up? I'm going to read it again, and there's nothing more I can add to it. It's just beautiful. All I can do is be a highlighter and say, look, here it is. This is in the more advanced stages of meditation. Most people are not willing to do the preliminary work to be able to get to this advanced level. I don't mean that insulting against anybody. I don't, but it's extremely important. That's why I preface this comment by saying here is something coming that is extremely important. And then here it is. A time comes when meditation stirs the unconscious and brings forward impressions from its hidden recesses. It quickens the method of analyzing, understanding, and surveying the whole dreaming state. Whatever dreaming reality is, it can be brought under the meditator's conscious control. That aspect of mind that dreams and the energy that is consumed by dreaming it's can be brought into creative use and channeled for higher purposes. Few will do it, but it can be. People dream their whole lives, but the dreaming state does not help anyone in the attainment of enlightenment. It doesn't say specific dreams are not helpful. Listen to it carefully. People dream their whole lives, but the dreaming state, the dreaming state, the plane of reality, the level of reality does not help anyone in the attainment of enlightenment. And he's telling the truth. That plane of reality is virtually worthless when what we're talking about is the realization of Turiya. Meditators do not dream. They've already figured out none of it's useful. None of it's useful. The meditator finally figures out. Most people will never figure that out because they still think that who I am is this waking state person and those dreams have some meaning to me. So we go to a dream therapist and say, can we talk about my dreams and how they, how this dream, oh, this dream means I'm a special, wonderful person out here. Oh, yes, I knew that I was selected by God to do some special work out here for these poor lost people in the world. These dreams are so wonderful. If we're talking about the realization of Turiya, that which is beyond the Atman, the Brahman, the Purusha, the Shiva, that's one of the Shakti and all that, then you come to see that the whole plane of reality is absolutely useless. People dream their whole lives, but the dreaming state does not help anyone in the attainment of enlightenment. <laughs> Meditators do not dream. Of course, sometimes they experience a sort of dream that can be called a prophetic dream. But during meditation, the mind is focused on one object and it flows uninterruptedly toward that object only. Thoughts, ideas, feelings, and desires do flow from the unconscious, but they do not have any power to disturb the meditator because his mind is concentrated. Those impressions are like other thoughts that pass through the mind but they do not create disturbance for the meditator. But the dreamer may be disturbed by his dreams because they are not under his conscious control and so therefore looks for meaning and looks for solutions. Guess what? They're already lost. Actually, this Shruti, this text, makes the aspirant aware that dreams alone are not the subject for analysis, but that the entire dreaming reality should be understood thoroughly. The nature of that dreaming reality is what needs to be understood, not by analyzing all the stupid dreams that happen from within it. The dreaming state is represented by the letter U or U, which comes between the A ah and the M. Mm. For knowing Om in a comprehensive way, one has to move to higher dimensions of consciousness. The higher dimension here means that the meditator also desires to know the sleeping state. This state is represented by the M, the last letter of Om. After examining all the joys and pleasures of the external world, finally one delights in having a deeper quality of joy during sleep. Consciousness withdraws itself from the waking state and the dreaming state and goes to the restful state of unconscious, which leads us to 
the 11th verse, which we'll do in a couple days. Now, if one has followed through all of this journey through this text up to this point, there's a possibility we can gain some insight here. If one were to pick up this book and just say, I'm going to look back here because this I want to know about the enlightenment part. I don't care about all that other part of this book. You have virtually not a chance in hell of understanding what was just said in these two pages we just looked at there. There's a journey there, and there's a contemplative journey that leads us to the point of even having the slightest ability to know what the book says. That's just the way this works. And so it's not a book that you can go to chapter 12 and read about Turiya and say, okay, now I'm, you know, it doesn't work that way. We want to know those levels. Of, we want to know waking. We want to know dreaming. We want to know deep sleep. And if we start to understand those and how they're working, we will come to see for ourselves very clearly that none of it means anything. It's just the nature it's the way in which reality manifests itself outward that creates the appearance that some of this is important and that I need to analyze it and figure it because I am of this or of that or the other. Anyway, to be continued. To be continued. And there's only two more verses left and a little bit of discussion about it. And uh, I've told this story many times before. When I first ran into this Mandukya Upanishad business and, and this, this discussion from Swami Rama, I worked hard. I have a pretty good mind, pretty intelligent. I worked trying to understand this thing. And to my credit, I had the wisdom somehow, I don't know how, I had the wisdom to understand. I don't have any idea what this damn book says. I was smart enough to figure out I was stupid is a way of saying it. And I didn't know for many years, for years later, that actually that's a sign of yogic intelligence. When you understand that I'm dumb, then you're starting to know something. And then gradually it started to make sense. And then there was the day I picked it up. I set it down. I said, I'm not ready for this. I need to throw it away or burn it or set it aside for some time. I don't know which I did. I don't think I ever threw it away, but I didn't look at it for a few years. And finally, a few years later, when I looked at it, finally it made sense. So there's something to this stuff. Now when we, we, we go through that, I'm sitting here talking to some of you like this. It's like, it's just so obvious. It's so obvious. And I understand that, it's, that it doesn't sound obvious. What, what the hell do you mean it's obvious? This is not obvious. And some of you I've known for a while, and, and, and it's starting to get obvious. You're understanding what it says. And, and to me, as a me out here in the waking state conscious mind, that's really, really neat. The great value. To me, there's great value in that. It means that sitting here babbling like this and going through this stuff over and over and over and over and over again, is not a waste, that there's some utility in it. And I find it exciting. I don't have anything significant, or if anything at all, on my bucket list. There's nothing, there's nothing left in, in, in this world out here that has any meaning to me other than this. And so when I know a few people, it's not the majority, it's not the masses, as the saying goes. But when I have the joy of knowing a few people, who can even sit and follow through a little bit on this conversation to me as a sitting here person is exciting. And I get a little taste of what it was like to watch Swami Rama feel that joy. It's why he liked me. He liked other people for different reasons. He liked me because I was listening. And that's pretty cool. Anyway, to be continued, to be continued. I know, Mir, but, you know, you're, you're one of them of whom I'm speaking. Mir says, doesn't sound obvious, but we'll keep on contemplating. But you're tracking with me, Mir. I know that. You're tracking. You're following along. Never away, says Roz. 
Most certainly there are those who listen. I am definitely. You're hearing now. The difference now, Roz, is 20 years ago you were listening, but you weren't hearing consciously. You were listening. You were listening. I noticed it then. And then you took some detours. Who cares? But now you're listening. And now my sense of it is you're, you're following the conversation. You're following it yourself. And to me, that's pretty cool. So we, us, we can all sit here and have these conversations and have it be cool. Notice the number of people is down now. And so now we're getting down to those who listen and, and follow along the conversation. So anyway, to be continued, I have a little bit of my now lukewarm chocolate to finish drinking. And that's what it's all about, right? It's a holiday. We're sitting here with some really nice people, both in ashram space and cyber space. And I have a hot chocolate and and the snow on the screen is lighter. So it's a pretty cool deal. Thank you for visiting, everybody, and playing. Bye-bye. I'm going to push the button. Adi says bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yvonne says bye.